I'm Yang Mu Kim, and this is Applied Digital Signal Processing. In this video, we take a big step towards digitizing our signals. After all, this series is about digital signal processing. We'll also take care of some unfinished business about frequency. Remember that sampling is taking measurement of a signal at regular intervals. We can store those measurements or samples and plot them, process them, transmit them, etc. I'll tell you up front that sampling has a lot to do with frequency. So recall our debt to Mr. Fourier, who said any periodic signal can be built from sinusoids, also known as frequencies. In the previous video, we extended that to cover all signals using the Fourier transform and the short time Fourier transform or spectrogram. So if every signal is a sum of sinusoids, then all we need to worry about is the sampling of sinusoids. If we get all of those right, the signal should be fine. So let's take a look at a sinusoid and see what happens if we sample it. Here's a sinusoid with a period of 10 milliseconds. So it's a frequency of 100 Hertz. Now let's take a measurement every millisecond, or at a rate of 1000 Hz. That's also 10 samples for each period of our 100 Hz sine wave. The key question for now is, knowing that it's a sinusoid, can we find the right sinusoid that fits these samples? That is, can we get back to our original wave exactly without losing any information, what's known as perfect reconstruction? Looking at these samples at 10 per period, it seems pretty clear what the original sinusoid was. But what if we take fewer samples, maybe every other one? Well, keeping every other one drops our sampling rate to 500 Hertz, or 5 per period. Perhaps you can still see that our original sine wave is in these samples. What if we take every other one of these samples? That takes us now to 250 Hertz, or 2.5 per period of our original signal. What's the sinusoid that fits these samples exactly? Well, perhaps you can see that our original sinusoid, or frequency, is still the one that fits these samples, even at just 2.5 samples per period. So, how many samples do we need to recover the original sine wave? Well, let's keep going lower, and take every other one of these. Uh-oh. Maybe now we have a problem. Because there's another sinusoid that fits these samples perfectly. Actually, the bigger issue is that there's a sinusoid at a lower frequency than our original that fits these samples exactly. This is aliasing, and it happens when we sample our signal too slowly. Aliasing makes frequencies appear different than they actually are. So that sounds bad. How can we avoid aliasing? So what we really want to know is how often do we need to sample in order to make sure that the lowest frequency sinusoid that fits our samples is the right one, the original. Well, going back to our original sinusoid, it would seem that if we maybe get the max and min of each period, that that would give us an unambiguous decision about the right sinusoid. That's two samples per period, or twice the maximum frequency of a signal. In this case, there's only one frequency, but remember, since all signals are just a sum of sinusoids, this would work for any signal. But catching the max and min values with our measurements is actually kind of lucky. Very lucky, in fact. What if we're not so lucky? What if we're actually really unlucky? We might get this. It's still two samples per period, but we've caught it when the signal is zero every time. Unfortunately, there's a lower frequency sinusoid that fits these samples perfectly, it's zero frequency. So this would be really bad. In order to avoid this, our sampling rate must be above two times the highest frequency. If we adhere to that, we're good. The lowest frequency that fits our samples will be the right one. This is called the Nyquist criterion, named after Harry Nyquist, an early signal processing researcher. Half the sampling rate is also called the Nyquist frequency, or Nyquist rate. This is the highest frequency that can be accurately preserved and reconstructed at the current rate. As I've mentioned previously, 
Human hearing can perceive sounds as low as 20 Hz and as high as 20 kHz. The high end is what matters in terms of sampling. By the Nyquist criterion, if the highest human perceptible frequency is 20 kHz, we have to sample at more than twice that, so more than 40 kHz. In developing the CD digital audio specification, they settled on 44.1 kHz, a little bit above 40 kHz, which is the most common standard for high quality music audio. But we do use other sampling rates, like 48 kilohertz or even 96 or 192 kilohertz, particularly for music production. Note that aliasing happens in all domains that involve sampling. One example you've likely seen is car wheels in movies or TV shows, where it looks like the wheels are spinning backwards. This is another form of aliasing. Why does it happen? Well, video is normally captured at a fixed number of image frames per second, like 24 or 30. If the rotation of a tire is less than half a full rotation between frames, we get an effect like this, which looks like a clockwise rotation. But if the wheel is spinning faster, more than half a rotation between frames, we get this which looks like a counterclockwise rotation. Oops. For video, we mostly just live with this aliasing. We'd have to film at a really high frames per second to avoid this, and the industry has basically decided it's not worth it for now. But in the audio world, not only can we avoid it, but we need to, because aliasing does really bad things to sound and music. Let's think about this a different way. What if we have a fixed sampling rate and just increase frequency past the Nyquist rate? Remember, that's half the sampling rate. Our sampling rate in this case is fixed at 11 kilohertz, and our signal increases in frequency at a constant rate. So in this idealized spectrogram, it looks like a line with a positive slope. Let's hear what happens to the sound. Hmm, it sounds like it bounces off the Nyquist rate and then starts descending in frequency. What's going on here? It turns out aliasing is even more insidious than we thought. To explain what's going on, we're going to have to take a deeper dive into frequency. Recall Euler's formula, which explains what a complex exponential or a single frequency is. It's a function that travels at a constant rate around the unit circle in the complex plane with the real values on the horizontal and imaginary on the vertical axes. Here we use the variable omega as a shorthand for two pi frequency, also known as the frequency in radians. This is also known as a phaser, not the Star Trek kind. You've probably also seen a different look at Euler's formula expressing the real and imaginary parts separately. Here's the expression of cosine, which gives us a hint as to what's going on, that a real valued cosine is composed of both a positive frequency phasor that rotates counterclockwise around the circle and a negative frequency phasor rotating clockwise around the unit circle. Watch the green dot, which is the sum of the two phasors. We see that to get an output that's purely real values or on the horizontal axis, we need two frequencies, a positive and a negative, whose imaginary components cancel each other out. What does that mean? Well, for all purely real valued signals like audio, the frequencies are both positive and negative that contribute equally and mirror each other. Similarly, the imaginary part is also represented by two phasors of opposite frequencies, resulting in the sign that stays on the vertical axis. If we tilt the real axis of our cosine to vertical and plot the sum of phasors over time, we can see that these sums are, in fact, cosine and sine. And just to check our math, we can also confirm that adding the real cosine and imaginary sine parts back together returns us to a complex exponential with a single frequency, or visually, that adding the phasers back together and dividing by two gets us back to where we started. So the deeper examination of frequency reveals that we need both positive and negative frequencies to represent real signals, but that they are kind of equal and opposites to each other. So what does this have to do with aliasing? 
let's return to our 100 hertz signal. Well, we know we must sample fast enough to prevent lower frequency sinusoids from fitting our samples. But what about higher frequency ones? Turns out, even when we adhere to the Nyquist criterion, there are many higher frequencies that fit our samples, like this one, or this one, and this one. Now, we haven't done anything wrong. For any sampled sinusoid, there will be an infinite number of higher frequency sinusoids that perfectly fit our samples. Now the convention is to treat the lowest frequency one as the original, which should be unambiguous if we're meeting the Nyquist criterion. But these higher frequency sinusoids do exist. They come into existence as soon as we sample. That might seem a little weird, but they are all equally valid sinusoids for our samples, and we ignore them at our own peril. Looking at it another way, let's return to our rising frequency sinusoid. Here's the idealized Fourier spectrum with positive and negative frequencies this time. Watch what happens as the frequency increases. As it starts to alias, it's actually the negative frequency of one of the aliases that becomes audible below the Nyquist rate. Those aliases are there, so we need to account for them. If this was a continuous time signal in the real world that we were sampling, we'd use an analog anti-aliasing filter to remove frequencies above the Nyquist rate. Ultrasonic frequencies above what we can hear do exist in the natural world, so all our devices that record audio, your computer, your phone, etc., employ such a filter to reduce those frequencies before sampling. So what does aliasing sound and look like in actual music? Let's listen to a piece of music and then artificially and poorly reduce the sampling rate to hear what it sounds like. In this case, I'll take a piece of music that was sampled properly at 44.1 kHz and then reduce it to lower sampling rates without accounting for aliasing. In the spectrum, we'll see the aliased copies of the spectrum come into view as we gradually reduce the sampling rate down to 8 kHz. So, first of all, aliasing sounds bad, distorting the audio with a real grating sound. Number two, even digital signals can be a source of aliasing, and we have to be particularly careful if we need to convert the sampling rate of a signal in order to account for aliasing. But is aliasing always a bad thing? There are synthesizers, particularly in the early days of digital audio in the 1980s that actually generated alias signals. Sometimes they were used to good effect, like in this famous example. That's from Van Halen's Jump from the album 1984. But for the most part, we want to avoid aliasing, particularly the unintended kind. So to do this, we must first satisfy the Nyquist criterion, that is, sample at more than twice the highest frequency we want to preserve. Second, we want to filter out an analog signal to remove frequencies higher than the Nyquist rate. Third, if we're generating signals digitally, we must take care to avoid unintentional aliasing. Fourth, we have to take special care when converting between sampling rates. Exactly how to do that is something we'll cover in the future. Rock on, and I'll see you in the next video.